Hi Mia! I recently talked with a developer who said they no longer need an operations team. Hi Martin! Why do they think that? They outsourced the infrastructure to Google by going serverless. Well, they might not need to replace hard drives anymore, but they still need a team that can focus on operational concerns. Oh, uh, what should they do then? Well, instead of getting rid of their operations team, they could adopt a new model. Now they can work on more interesting aspects of infrastructure and operations, like applying software engineering to build automation. That's called site reliability engineering. You said site reliability engineering might be a good way to operate instead. Uh, what is that? Site reliability engineering, or SRE, is what you get when you apply software engineering concepts to infrastructure and operations. It was born in 2003 out of Google's need to operate reliable systems at scale. Okay, that sounds useful. Definitely, and there are other related movements throughout the industry like DevOps and production engineering, but in my experience, SRE works really well. So Mia, in one of your previous roles before Google, you did SRE work, is that right? Yeah, I've been on call for production systems with millions of registered users, and I've seen how things can go wrong. <laughs> I bet, millions. Uh, that's some serious scale right there. Definitely, and when you get to that scale, you have to start reducing toil and adopt something like SRE if you want to keep up. All right, so you said going serverless does not mean you can skip operations work. Right, you still need some sort of operations team, but you can be smarter about operations and adopt something like SRE. The goal is less toil and more interesting work at this higher level of abstraction. And what do you mean by toil? So toil is work that's manual, repetitive, and most importantly, automatable. An example of toil might be maintaining hardware in an on-prem environment, like using monitoring graphs to keep an eye on hard drive failures. Right, sitting and watching graphs all day sounds inefficient. Yeah, and you could find ways to automate your hard drive management on-prem, but cloud providers have this down to a science, and it's often cheaper to pay them to do it. Outsourcing this aspect of your stack helps eliminate this toil. Wait, so if engineers no longer have to spend their time monitoring hardware, what will they spend their time on? They can start by focusing on app-level monitoring and automation. And while this is a higher level of abstraction than most engineers are probably used to working with, it allows for more impact, and they can be more proactive instead of constantly fighting fires further down the stack. All right, uh, let's break that down, Mia. First, app-level monitoring. Is that different from regular old monitoring? Yes and no. So measuring CPU load on your servers is an example of pretty standard monitoring. However, once you've gone serverless, that metric's less interesting because Google will horizontally scale for you. And that frees up time to focus on metrics that matter to your users, like response times. Yep, I could see how business folks would be more interested in response times than in CPU load. Right, it's easier to work together on higher level metrics. A business person won't know if 70% CPU load is good or bad, but they will know that a 0.1 second response time is good. Right, right, these higher level metrics sound more useful. Yeah, and compared to resource usage, getting information from within the application, like traces and query latency, helps you better understand what users are actually experiencing. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so circling back to what you said before, automation was the other thing. What, what would that look like? So maybe it takes a lot of manual work to run through the testing and release process. If you automate that, you'll end up shipping your code faster and with better quality. And if you don't have to monitor the lower layers of the stack all the time, you'll have time to look into points of operational friction. I like that. So do I. Automation of common tasks means that you can scale your operations as traffic grows. This doesn't mean that you don't need SREs at all, but rather the people who already support systems can be much more efficient. So SRE can scale sublinearly as traffic grows. Okay, so let's say an organization switch from on-prem machine to serverless computing in Google Cloud. What aspects of operations work would change? Well, when you run an on-prem system, you manage all parts of the system, from networking all the way up to the application. Yes, and we did that at the startups I worked at years ago. Let me tell you, Mia, that was a lot of work. Yeah, it really is. Many teams want to offload some of that work to a cloud provider so they can scale the team better. Instead of running it themselves, they just rent the networking and compute that they need, often called infrastructure as a service, or IaaS. The end result is that you don't have to worry about anything below the virtualization of the machine. 
Uh, and why would a large cloud provider be able to handle this virtualization, server, storage, networking, all that stuff better than the customer themselves? Cloud providers like Google operate at scale and can buy and operate hardware in a very cost efficient way. Because of this, they can pass some of those savings onto the consumer. Years of experience designing and running infrastructure means they can provide reliable and resilient service. Got it. So if you pick infrastructure as a service, your cloud provider handles everything from virtualization on down. But I've heard of many customers who don't want to manage the operating system, for example. Right. And then you go with platform as a service or PaaS. Ah, that's where I want to be. Uh, that's serverless computing, right? Yeah, that's serverless. And many organizations prefer to go serverless because it leaves fewer things for them to manage. Ah, fewer things to manage. That's good. Uh, should everyone go serverless? For many teams, serverless works very well. I should mention that some organizations have regulatory requirements that prevent them from going serverless. Others might have software that can't run on serverless platforms. But that said, by and large, most scenarios are actually compatible with serverless, even those with special requirements. And then there's the question of control. Yeah, some organizations don't go serverless because they aren't yet comfortable giving up control of the machine. Yep, it can be scary to give up low level management, especially for a mission critical workload. Right, and many organizations realize that serverless can increase productivity for their developers, but they want to go slow so they can learn the characteristics of serverless before they adopt it wholesale. Honestly, that approach makes sense to me. Me too. I should mention that you can ask your cloud provider to do even more than PaaS. If you're using Gmail, for example, you don't write the software or figure out how to store the email data. Google does that for you. And that's called software as a service, or SaaS. So let's say I built a system for managing expense reports. It would look like software as a service, SaaS, to my customers, because all they do is enter expenses. They don't write software, right? Right, and if you built your system on Cloud Run or Cloud Functions, it looks like platform as a service to you. Okay, uh, so platform as a service uh, for me, exactly what would I manage? For platform as a service, you're responsible for the application and the data. For the data, that means taking backups and that sort of thing? Yes, and even if you're running on top of a fault-tolerant major cloud provider, you may still need backups and restores. You may have written an application bug that destroyed some data, or a customer may accidentally delete an expense report, all things where your application could cause a problem for itself. Makes sense. Uh, so I need to enable backups. Exactly, but it's not enough to simply enable backups. You want to rehearse the process for restoring a backup. If it doesn't work when you need it, it's useless. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, you know me, uh, I've deleted not one, but two production databases at a startup I used to work at. Thankfully, we had backups. So when it comes to running my system on serverless, uh, how would SREs manage the application? The SRE team would monitor that the application works as advertised and is healthy. For example, they could monitor response times experienced by users and the number of errors displayed to users. And you mentioned things visible to users. You'd only monitor things from the user's perspective? No, but the user's perspective is very important. After all, most service level objectives or SLOs tend to be built around the user's experience. Uh, yeah, I've heard about SLAs. Are SLOs the same? Great question. No, they're different. Um, SREs tend to use both of those terms when talking about the goals for the user experience. An SLO describes a realistic operational goal for the uptime or user experience. An SLA is usually a business contract that describes the consequences for violating an SLO. There's also a third metric in this space, Service Level Indicator, or SLI. I'm guessing that is the method used for measuring the SLO? Exactly. An SLI is usually a metric used to determine if you're meeting your SLO. That makes sense. Yeah, the model tends to work really well. If you want to dive deeper on this topic, the free Site Reliability Engineering book at sre.google is a great resource as well. OK, so we talked about making sure we know if the user's experience is degraded. Uh, but what about preventing outages in the first place? Definitely. There are some key metrics you can use to infer and predict application health. And what do you normally look at, Mia? I like to look at the four golden signals. Latency, traffic, saturation, and errors. OK, and can you walk us through what that would look like in practice and on serverless specifically? Definitely. So let's start with latency. 
Whether your application is serverless or not, keeping an eye on the amount of time it takes to service a request is crucial. This helps identify bottlenecks like database query latency, for example. And a sudden spike in latency could indicate an application issue as well, right? Yeah, exactly. The next metric is traffic, which describes the amount of demand on the system. This can be helpful for determining the individual container, also known as vertical, resources for your service. Right, because Cloud Run will horizontally scale the number of instances to match the traffic demand, but each individual container might need more resources, uh, like memory. Yep, and I'm glad you mentioned horizontal scaling, because that's one of the things that makes saturation less important on serverless. It's difficult to saturate. That's a win for serverless in my book. Uh, anything else people should keep an eye on? Yeah, I'd also say it's a good idea to keep an eye on errors and quotas, like max instances. If you're getting high numbers of failed requests or an increase in error messages in general, it means something's not working properly. Well, thank you for explaining all of this to us, Mia. I'm pretty much convinced you'd need an operations team and ideally an SRE team, even if you've gone serverless. Definitely. The reduced toil from going serverless leaves more time for important and interesting work that helps map directly to the user experience. Thank you everyone for watching. If you have questions for me or me, uh, please enter them in the comments below. Also, let me know if there are other serverless topics you'd like to see in future episodes. We read every single comment. Until next time.